welcome everyone. I'm very happy to um, have our first uh, health law seminar of the uh, new academic year. This is the first time that we're meeting again in person uh, after two uh, strange years of COVID. So I'm uh, particularly happy that, that I can introduce today um, uh, my colleague, uh, Colleen Flood, who is a uh, lost daughter of uh, law school. So we, <laughs> we still hope to be able to convince her to come back. Um, Colleen um, uh, is uh, University of Ottawa Research Chair in Health Law and Policy, and she's the inaugural director of the University of Ottawa Center for Health Law Policy and Ethics. And her research uh, interests are focused on the role of law in shaping health and healthcare systems and the appropriate roles for the public and private sector. She is the author and editor of 12 books, um, editor of uh, Housebury Laws of Canada Public Health, uh, co-editor of Vulnerable, which is a recent book actually particularly focusing in the context of uh, COVID on the law policy and ethics of COVID-19. And she's a co-editor of uh, Administrative Law in uh, Context. Uh, she was uh, before here uh, Canada Research Chair at our Faculty of Law, uh, was cross-appointed also to the School of Public Health, uh, School of Public Policy and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. And from uh, 2006 to 2011, she served as the Scientific Director at the Canadian Institute for Health Services and Policy Research. So in the past, she has also been running these series. And so uh, we're particularly happy to have her uh, present today on uh, implementing, implementing a dental care program in Canada, constitution and policy challenges. Then we'll have a commentary by Reza Deeper, who is uh, at the um, uh, Institute of Health Policy Management Evaluation, a, a long-standing professor for many years. Is that, uh, particularly, her research particularly focuses on issues uh, of, uh, of health policy, uh, constitutional division of powers, and uh, uh, she uh, was very eager and very enthusiastic to, uh, to comment on, uh, on Colleen's paper. Um, I, before uh, Colleen starts, I will distribute for the students uh, an attendance list, and anybody who uh, is attending here who is not on our email list may also add their name simply so that they keep, uh, that they that they will be informed of uh, future health uh, law sessions, uh, public health, uh, health law seminars, I'm sorry. Uh, so um, uh, after Colleen's presentation and, uh, and Professor uh, Deber's uh, commentary, um, I will start with some, some questions from the students and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, Colleen. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to start um, to remember for a moment our, our colleague, Professor Karen Knopf, who passed away uh, a few days ago. And uh, uh, she was here when I was here uh, 20 years ago. And I remember her back. So sorry for your loss. And, uh, and just to remember a great woman and a great, uh, a great professor. Um, I actually started this series uh, when I first came here uh, 22 years ago. And I started one before that at Dalhousie that just celebrated their 200th. So I was pretty proud of that. And then at University of Ottawa, we would also have a health law seminar series. So one would think with all this information floating around, we could finally be getting somewhere, but <laughs> it doesn't always seem to uh, trans translate. But I'm really happy to be back. This, this is my old stop around. I did my master's and my doctorate here before. Um, getting my first job at Dalhousie and then getting hired back at U of T. And I spent a lot of time in this room as a student and I have very fond memories. And I'm really, really glad to see that despite the beautiful new building and all of the developments, they still have the hideous peach paint in the ladies' washroom that they, have, <laughs> that they had when I was still here. And it, and it makes me feel happy to see that, that there's um, still some things like that. Um, I've worked for a long time uh, around issues of public private finance and public Medicare. I work a lot on issues around the Canada Health Act and thinking about institutional design. So how should we design our healthcare system? And the role of law in um, trying to make sure that the healthcare system we experience is, meets our expectations. Um, and, and in particular, make sure that the most vulnerable amongst us, um, you know, get the healthcare that they need when they need it. Uh, and so that has really been my 
my life's work uh, up to now. And then, um, you know, this suddenly this moment happened in the last uh, few months uh, for, you know, what we political scientists call a window of opportunity for um, significant expansion of Canadian Medicare to include dental care, at least for people under earning under $90,000 a year. Um, and that was because of a liberal agreement with the NDP, as you probably know, um, that in exchange for achieving certain policy milestones, that um, they would vote with them on confidence motions. And so basically allow the Liberals to stay in power um, for the next little while. But to do that, uh, the NDP insisted that, for example, uh, there be coverage for kids from families earning under 90K um, within this year, by the end of this year. Now, if you know anything about policy formation, that was a really big um, ask, really crazy, actually, uh, to insist on that because there's just zero time. And so um, one of the things I've done in the past is um, organize these meetings, like, like I call them best brains, you know, at CIHR, and now we call them policy salons, and try to say to the government, you know, what do you need advice on? Um, we'll try to bring some experts together. And so we did do that for this topic uh, with uh, some of the bureaucrats inside Health Canada. I felt sorry for them that they had to really pull this out of the hat so fast uh, without any um, pre preparation. We've been talking for decades about pharma care, so they do have a lot of background work um, and policy work on that, but really nothing on dental care because nobody was expecting it. Uh, so they had to go from zero to 60 really fast. So I asked some friends to help me uh, think about this um, and to really try to get creative about what kind of policy options there are. Um, and I find that working across disciplines really helps me with thinking, like, am I thinking about this correctly? Am I not seeing, you know, one side of the horse somehow? Mm -hmm. So that's how we did it. Um, Sarah Allen, who's a lovely uh, uh, health economist who works with Razor, um, and Sarah Lazard, who is uh, a master's student with us at the University of Ottawa. Greg Marshallton, um, who is a polymath, who uh, was here, just retired. He's a historian, a political scientist, he was a lawyer, and he worked for uh, Roy Romano's government. Peter Oliver is an expert in constitutional law and spending power. So I really needed his, um, his thoughts on uh, some of the, the innovative stuff that we were thinking about and whether it was actually constitutionally possible. Because you can just what I find is public, like public health or public policy, you come up with all these ideas, but the value add of having you guys in the room is that you can also do the legal uh, tests, right? Will it survive a privacy challenge? Will it survive a division of powers challenge? Will it survive a charter challenge? Um, so these are important things. Um, and then Carlos Quinones is a um, dentist, dentist expert, uh, and he's just, um, he's now the head of dentistry at at Western University. So we thought to bring all of these folks together was the way to do it. Um, and as I've said, oh, yes, maybe it's froze. Okay, you might need to call that lady. <laughs> I'll just keep speaking and we'll figure it out on the fly. Um, so uh, I will be showing you now a little umbrella of, uh, of, uh, of um, public Medicare and dental care being uh, left out. Um, it's been a significant problem. I actually might just need to get my computer because some of my notes are on my slides. So. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, it's always the way, isn't it? <laughs> So great being back in person. <laughs> um, okay. 
So yeah, um, so uh, what I plan to do today then is to talk a little bit about the importance of um, dental health um, and then to talk about some of the existing uh, funding of dental care in uh, Canada. What, I, what we saw is what should be the policy goals for dental care. So, you know, what are we actually aiming for has got to be um, critical. And then how to get there. So what are the policy options uh, in the context of division of powers and what is feasible? Right? So, uh, so policy goals, policy options, division of powers to sort of filter those policy options. So the pros and the cons, the you know, likelihood of anything being susceptible to constitutional review um, was what we did and then where I thought we would um, get to. It's a real damn shame that this isn't working because I have some gory slides to show you. Um, okay, so um, what I was going to show you is some disgusting pictures of caries in people's teeth. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you sounded in pain, Razor. I was like, uh oh. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, you know, the importance of oral health is pretty clear. I think just if you've ever had a cavity, you will know the pain uh, and suffering can go along with it. And so imagine that being untreated um, and trying to study and work all of those kinds of things. We also know that um, poor dental health is associated with other poor health outcomes. So uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease in particular, um, but also some other cognitive diseases uh, seems to be associated with poor dental health or dental outcomes. Not quite sure why that is, but it may have something to do with inflammation. Um, and the problems associated with that. Uh, it can worsen diabetes. Um, and all of these things mean that uh, people who um, have untreated dental health care needs um, can cause a lot of additional costs to the healthcare system. Um, so they can end up with some figure of kids um, in cities from the poorer income quintile. Um, oh, voila. There you go. You're I finished. found it. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, poorer income quintile um, being two and a half times more likely to have to go to hospital for treatment. And, you know, every time you step into a hospital door, there's a, a lot of extra costs. Of course, right now, good luck uh, getting treated. Um, so, um, and yet one in five Canadians, we know, avoid um, going to the dentist because of cost. So essentially, in a nutshell, um, we have a huge private system for dental care. Um, we have a very low rate of public funding for dental services uh, in Canada compared to other OECD countries. We're right at the bottom. Um, we basically rely on private health insurance coverage. I have it through my employer. You probably have some as students or through your parents. Um, so 56% of us have private insurance. It's private, but we get tax breaks to get that insurance our employers do. So it's only private in a bit. 36% um, of people have to pay out of pocket. About 6% of Canadians have some kind of public insurance. Um, through different programs. And I'm not, I don't have time to go through all the programs, but at the federal level, there's the FNIP program, which covers First Nations and uh, Indigenous peoples to some extent. Uh, and then at the provincial level, what you find is that there are very splintered, scattered, fragmented programs that are really aimed at specific populations. So for example, Healthy Smiles Ontario is aimed at poor children. Now, I was involved with a review of that program several years ago. That's actually how I met Carlos. And um, what was actually shocking, what was shocking though, was the very small percentage of children 
poor children that were covered by that program that actually access that program. So there is a, a difference between insurance on paper and actually getting access. And I want to come back to that point because I think it's critical in the design of the program. Um, and as she, you see here as well that, um, you know, the cost of dental care has increased phenomenally over, you know, the last 60 years or so. Um, but the incomes of people, if they're expected to pay for it out of pocket, have not in any way kept pace. And this would be what you would expect, really, because when you're in private, it's, you know, they can charge what they want, there's really no restrictions, um, there's no single payer to bargain them down. And you really, you know, I don't know about you, but if I get told what I'm paying at the end of the visit, there's no negotiating it really up, up front, right? So you're, it's not really a, a marketplace where you see the price of the shoes and think, might go get those other ones, right? Like you're really, um, stuck with that. So, um, so here are what we think are the policy goals, and I'm going to go through and explain why we think those should be the policy goals. The first is universal coverage. The second is that we need a fair process to decide what is in and what is out of the insurance package. The third is that we need to actually ensure actual access to care and not just rhetorical coverage. That's critical. And then accountability. Um, and this has been sort of something that I've come back to again and again in our healthcare system is that it's basically the, the essential problem in our healthcare system is splintered accountability, lack of accountability for things like quality, access, safety. These are um, things we don't do well uh, in the Canadian system. So um, universal health insurance coverage. The first point on this is that the plan, both from the NDP and from uh, the Liberals, uh, is to be a two-tier healthcare system for dental. So by design, uh, it will only cover people under 90K. Uh, the feds are currently saying that they'll be a payer of last resort. So even if you are earning under 90K, if you somehow have insurance coverage, then that has to happen first before they will kick in, right? So um, the problem with that, all of that, is not actually gunning for universal insurance means that you will always have these splintered systems where you have difficulty retaining labor in the public plan. So we already have this now where dentists don't want to provide dental services to poor people, even though the public plan pays for them because they're not, you know, not always... Uh, um, just bouncing in to get their Invisalign. Right? They might have problems. They might, little kids, poor kids, uh, might not be actually that crazy about sitting in a dental chair and, and being hurt, you know, uh, in, the, in the pursuit of the greater good uh, and so on. So, um, so that's part of the problem is how then will you make sure that there's enough dentists to provide for the public Plan. And then I think you will immediately have um, a problem of, you know, how do you prevent upselling and extra billing? So, you know, every time I go to a dentist, it feels a bit more like a hairdresser. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's about how good you look and, um, you know, they're always wanting to do things to me. I actually have pretty much close to perfect teeth, even though I don't look after them. And um, I've got four fillings and... <laughs> every time they want to do a, an x-ray because they own the x-ray machine and I say well I don't need it and they're like are you sure are you pregnant I'm like a little while ago now uh, and uh, so I fight the morph on that but the upselling part of dentistry is there so how will you regulate all of that right so it seems to me that the goal here should be universal access but even so, I mean, uh, you know, I appreciate um, even the willingness to try to expand to the folks ending, earning under 90K. This chap here, um, his name is Moses. That's not his real name, uh, but he came from Korea. Um, he, uh, he went blind from an untreated abscess. Uh, the cost to treat it was $1,800. He has a sort of a convenience store in Toronto we did 
and he couldn't afford it. And so he just, he, and he was too embarrassed to tell the dentist he couldn't afford it. So he went home and, and one thing led to the other and um, he ended up blind. So you just to sort of see some of the knock-on costs from um, failure to provide essential, um, uh, essential dental services, right? So, uh, but there is a policy challenge here around the, uh, the fact that some of what the dentists do are really kind of hairdressing services. So this means that um, a really important part of whatever the federal government does here is that they need to make sure that there is a, a, um, a strong process for determining the formula. So what will be medically necessary and what won't be? And it's a challenge because there's not a lot of great evidence for actually a lot of what dentists do now for people, right? So there's some strong evidence on a few things, but a lot of not great evidence on, on many things for what they do. So, uh, and then there's the upselling part, right? So you should perhaps have these um, kinds of orthodontic treatment or these kinds of braces, or you should have this other x-ray. So determining the formulary will be really important. And I think what we've learned from uh, Medicare, public Medicare for physician and hospital services, is that it has to be evolving, right? Like if you set it in stone for something in the 60s or the 70s, it won't meet our needs now. So you have to have something that is um, able to change over time and space and really evolve to uh, meet our needs. And so that the public feel that, you know, this plan is really for them, right? That, they're, that this, it's evolving as new technologies come in, that they're put in, old things maybe go out, but there's a, a good process for determining that. So I think that doing this is um, really important that we have um, uh, a great system. And it's a, it's a hard one because we, you know, we have right now a, a very, uh, very extensive private pay system uh, with a lot of upselling occurring. Um, so then the do part, as I mentioned, is to make sure that there's actual access to care. So you will have read, I am sure, about and maybe experienced, I hope not, the problems of access to care right now, uh, a knock-on effect of the pandemic and the burnout of healthcare providers and the fact that many of them are just sick and can't come to work right now. Uh, so trying to get access to health care is difficult. But even without that, the knock-on effect of the pandemic, far too many Canadians don't have access to a primary health care provider. Far too many Canadians are having to wait for, um, you know, uh, actually quite important treatments and surgeries and so on. So I think we can clearly say that the Canada Health Act criteria promises reasonable accessibility and that is not being met. But there's no teeth on that, right? There's no, there's no enforcement of the failure to meet accessibility. It's written on paper, you know, it's in the Canada Health Act, but we're not doing anything about it. So it seems to me that for the dental care, we need to make sure that we actually have access. Like what is the point of funneling money to dentists and, um, and dental offices that the very vulnerable don't want to go to, right? Or they are not convinced that they need primary and preventive care, so should they take time off work to take their little kid, you know, single mom perhaps, tough, precarious employment, do I take my kid for the scraping and cleaning, which they don't want to go to anyway, right? Do what, how do I, how do you do that? And then to feel, um, and there's some research on this, to feel kind of, inferior or intimidated, you know, judgment is passed on you because of the state of your teeth or you haven't done this and you haven't done that. I don't know if you've had that lecture from the dentist, but it's really unpleasant. Or the worst, you know, they're little handmaidens. Uh, but uh, just, it's not that great, right? And you can imagine that people in lower socioeconomic groups might not really enjoy that. So how do we ensure access um, to care and, um, I grew up in New Zealand, that's where this melodious accent is from, not Australia. And, but in both jurisdictions, um, what we experienced as kids was a dental nurse in school, 
So the dental nurse was part of a faculty on the school and there was a building, the dental nurse basically saw all the kids in the school and then started again. So we all had dental coverage, you know, for primary and preventive care as kids. And now they still do, do this with mobile clinics. They had some experiences with this in Canada. They, they tried it in Saskatchewan, for example, and I think Manitoba, and it was going really well, but there was opposition from the dental profession uh, and uh, they basically shut that down. So, but one can see that, um, you know, bringing the dentist, the dental treatment to the kids would be a really good plan, I think. So, um, so one of the options we think should be on the table is that the federal government directly funds innovation in the community to provide dental care in schools and community um, in community centres, um, as well as trying to build um, a dental insurance coverage that's provided more traditionally right, by, by dentists and their offices. But to think just doing that will get at the access question. I think our experience, the evidence and experience that we have would suggest that's not the case. How am I doing on time? Right. Oh, okay. Um, when do you want me to stop? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, you're, I'll you're tell yelling. you uh, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> Actually, my aunt was one 10, of these, my, right. one of, I, my aunt was a dental nurse um, in, uh, in schools. So the other uh, thing that is important and that we've learned as well is that um, unless we actually measure what we're doing, so the feds, for example, have announced that their plan for this year is basically to give uh, cash payments to poor families, poorer families. So if you're earning under $70,000 a year as a family, you can apply for basically $650 a year uh, for two years to cover your kids and for dental care. You have to attest that you're going to spend it on this and you have to give the name of your dental care provider, right? So they're kind of doing it like a child care benefit, but for, for dental, right? So that's, that's their response to having to do this in a rush. And I'm going to kind of explain some of why that may be not, I mean, I totally understand why they had to do it in this time frame. That's how they did it. But in the longer run, this is not, in my view, the best option at all. Um, and But one of the things that's missing from that is the accountability piece. Like, how will they measure whether this has made a difference? Um, do they have, there's nothing that I can see in the legislation about that. How will they know that, you know, poorer families have actually been able to access dental care, that it's made a difference? Um, and any of those kinds of things. So having accountability, transparency, and performance measurement has to be part of anything new that we're doing in Medicare uh, because we've not really had that in the, and we suffer the consequences, right? So, you know, we know if we have better evidence about things, we have better information, then it's harder to hide stuff that's going on and it's, and it's easier to hold those who should be accountable accountable for what they're doing so this sounds like the most boring piece of what I'm presenting but it's actually the most important piece of everything because without that we can't really know whether we're winning or losing going ahead what we're you know whether we're getting value for money whether we're actually helping the people that we're wanting to help or we're just distri redistributing money back to the people who already really didn't need it right so that's uh, that's an important part okay um, so, mm -hmm. division of powers, um, so you probably are all very aware of the problems with um, division of powers in the healthcare system, and I can't give you in this time frame the whole nine yards on, on this, but in essence, because, um, you know, the, the general public and the provinces and the federal government like to say that healthcare is a matter of provincial jurisdiction. They are wrong. Uh, healthcare is a matter of shared jurisdiction between the federal and provincial governments. The Supreme Court has said so many times. And it depends on the topic, um, whether or not um, who has sort of primary jurisdiction in the area. And sometimes provincial and federal governments can do 
work on the same thing at the same time. So you also know the idea of cooperative federalism, right? So the idea that we're all going to hold hands and kumbaya and work together. Um, and I think, you know, how we're doing that in um, Medicare so far is really not working. I think we're all experiencing that. So we need to really think this through. What does cooperative federalism really mean? And uh, again, I'm just going to really cut the chase here. To me, it means that they're going to use all of the tools that they have. So what tools does the federal government have at its disposable, disposable, at, at its, dis, it, what federal, what tools does the federal government have to achieve improve healthcare, working collabor collaboratively with provinces, okay? So they should be using everything they got to improve healthcare, working collaboratively as they can with provinces, right? So I sort of feel like that we've just got sort of stuck in a rut but it's a Canada, and me too, like Canada Health Act or nothing, but let's get more creative about what is feasible out there. And one thing I can say about the cash payment thing is that I like its innovation. Right? So it's trying to do something a bit different. Uh, and I mentioned the accountability problem. Oh, did I lose my, oh yeah, here we go. So this is an old one that I had from back at the time of SARS. Uh, and when I was here, actually, and, uh, you know, everyone pointing the finger at everybody else, mm -hmm. who's, who's accountable for SARS? Well, you know, they're all running for cover on COVID, that's for sure. But um, even back then, there were so many reports about different levels of government, who's responsible. So we really need to avoid this. We need to ensure there's accountability for dental care, you know, for Medicare. Who's responsible for making sure access, quality, uh, performance reporting and all these kinds of things are met. So in a nutshell, there is um, a bunch of different models that are possible or different uses of the federal government's powers that could uh, move us along bit a bit to achieve those policy goals. So the first is the Canada Health Act model. So that's where the Fed sort of set in stone. They say, here are the conditions and you need to comply with them. If you don't comply with them, we'll hold back the money. And the problem with this is that they don't. They don't want to enforce those conditions. The only conditions they've ever really enforced are around extra billing user charges. So in theory, we're fully insured. But accessibility, which is a criteria of the Canada Health Act, they've never held back funds from the provinces for not meeting that. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all, we all experience uh, uh, that as well. And part of the problem is, is that they've stopped the kind of out of the deal was 50-50 back in the day, 50% of funding from the feds, and that got retracted. So um, over time, it's lost its way. The NIHB model is the model, is where the federal government actually um, has agreements with dentists to provide services to Indigenous and First Nations people. So they, they more clearly have jurisdiction here because they have jurisdiction over Indians and land reserve for Indians under the Constitution Act. Um, and using that power, they provide um, insurance benefits. But this involves negotiating with dentists um, all over the show to try to do this. Still many Indigenous people do not access uh, dental care, um, even though in theory they are covered. So you've still got that problem of accessibility. Bilateral agreements, so what has happened in recent years is the feds have given up trying to have some big agreement with all the provinces because they all, you know, it doesn't seem to really flow. So they have, um, have agreements with different provinces to, for example, put money into home care and to try to realise some outcomes. So that seems to have been something of a path forward pros and cons that I've laid out in the paper that some of you uh, read. Oops, sorry. Um, the tax, the, uh, sorry, the agency model is the model that I'm going to kind of plump for uh, in a sense. So the agency model, the Canadian Blood Services is an example of this. So the Canadian Blood Services is an arm's length administrative agency that has been set up by the federal and provincial governments to run the blood services for Canada. And that came about after, you know, something terrible had to happen. The tainted blood scandal uh, had to happen. Uh, before that came to pass, 
uh, it, it used to be the Red Cross that ran the, the, the blood. So they created Canadian blood services. Now, the interesting thing about this is constitutionally, a government can't delegate its authority to another government. So the provincial government can't delegate its authority over dental, regulating dental insurance or regulated dentists to the federal government, but it can delegate authority to a agency, right? Uh, and because of course they can always take it back. So the, the locus of power still resides with the, with the provincial government now. So we, I thought, well, this is actually very interesting, isn't it? Because the federal government could delegate um, authority to administer its uh, health insurance benefits. It can, um, pro provinces too, could delegate authority to one central agency, just as they do with Canadian Blood Services. And then perhaps we could actually have a plan that works for most Canadians. Now, some provinces, probably Quebec, would not want to party on that, just as they do with Canadian Blood Services. They have their own version, Ima Quebec. But, you know, they kind of mirror each other. So uh, it's not necessarily the end of the world if one or two provinces do their own thing, but basically mirror what is happening at the, at the centre. So I like this model because it has um, accountability, it has clarity, you can focus the uh, activities that you need in there, the formulary <coughs> making, uh, and so on. Um, the voucher model is another model that is, they were considering, which is similar to the NHIB model. Uh, basically, you know, you give someone a voucher and they can, but they can only spend it on dental, right? So, but again, um, the problem with that, which is the same problem as the cash for care model, you, uh, uh, you're, you know, you're giving everybody the same amount of money, but look, with most healthcare, some people have very high needs and others of us have basically nothing. Right. Um, so some primary and preventive care, you know, we all kind of need for dental, generally go in, have a checkup, have your teeth scraped and stuff like that. But, you know, the people that have really high needs, you know, they have kind of lost, they lost all their teeth in the front and this kind of thing. Um, you know, it's difficult to chew, difficult to bite. You know, they are going to cost a lot more money. But both with the voucher model and the cash for care model that they've rolled out, they're still only going to get 600 $50, right? So our chap that went blind, I mean, the difference between six fifty dollars and eighteen hundred, dollars maybe that would have been enough that you could have got treated, but it might not have been. Right? So you would still wind up with that. So generally in healthcare, what we find is that, you know, the distribution is kind of like, hardly, we hardly use anything. I never use anything at a doctor. I'd go like once every couple of years just to get all my prescriptions. Now I don't even do that. I just go to the pharmacy and I call them. Um, and then, but some people are like, right? Like once you get really sick, the wheels mm -hmm. seem to fall off and you get everything um, and you're a high user. So if you just give everybody a little bit, you're not really helping mm -hmm. those people. So that's part of the problem with, with what they've promoted. Um, so basically I'm, I'm not, I'm going to run out of time and I want to hear from Razor and from you. So I've just sort of quickly done, you know, described the, the problem. Um, and with all of these things, if the federal government goes too far in trying to prescribe how the plan would be administered in the provinces, then they are suspect. Uh, there is the possibility of constitutional challenge. So um, no one's actually successfully challenged the Canada Health Act in the past, but let's face it, they actually haven't been enforcing it. Right. So uh, if um, the feds tried to put in place a lot of different conditions on what dentists could do, then there is the risk that that would be viewed as regulated dentists and then subject to a constitutional challenge. So this one, I think, you know, I love the Canada Health Act, but it doesn't, I don't think it's going to do what we need for dental care. Direct payments, I've already discussed that. Um, it's a possibility. So negotiating with dental unions, essentially, they could do this. So um, this was the insight I think I got from my colleague, Peter Oliver, was the ability to just spend. Can, 
be transformative. Uh, but once you start to tie conditions to the spending, then it starts to smell and look like regulation. Once it smells and looks like regulation, it's more likely to be subject to constitutional um, challenge. So figuring that out is, um, is where we got to. The bilateral agreements I already mentioned, the intergovernmental agency, which is the Canadian blood services model, the tax deduction model, which is good if you're rich, uh, the voucher model, which is sort of a bit for everybody, and the cash for care model, which is what they landed on for the next two years. And just to be clear, what's good about it is that the federal government is clearly accountable for this program. We don't have splintered accountability between the federal and provincial governments. Who's responsible for it? We know it's the federal government. I like that. Um, but there's you know, a risk of that the money won't be really spent. There's just an attestation. We don't actually know. Uh, how it will be spent, whether it will be spent. And the people buying the care, we just have to take the prices that the dentists give you, right? So you don't have the benefit of a single payer negotiating better prices with the dentist, which is what we get when you have public Medicare. Right? That's why private systems are so expensive. If you look at the US, they spend more public dollars per person than we do here. So let me repeat that. More tax dollars are spent per person in the US than we spend here, and they don't really get much more. They have the same number of doctors per capita, the same number of hospital beds per capita, but they pay more for the same thing. Right? So that's what you get when you have um, a lot of private in the mix. You have high prices and not necessarily more value for when you have a public payer in the mix, then they can negotiate prices um, with the providers and hopefully get a better value for money. Right? So that's what's missing with this. And it won't also help people who have high cost needs. So it won't help most, right? Uh, which one would have thought that was the rationale, really, was to help somebody like Moses or his kids, kind of thing. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the problem is not being able to help the most vulnerable. So where do we think we should go to then? Um, I, uh, I don't know if my colleagues are watching, they're probably thinking, holy hell, I never agreed to that. But anyway, this is what I'm thinking we should go to and love to hear your feedback on this. Uh, so the federal government should use all its powers, right? What powers does it have in healthcare? It's got quite a few, uh, including uh, its spending power. And that's the way to do collaborative federalism, to bring it all to the table and to be flexible uh, and work with provinces as much as possible. But, you know, just the throwing up the hands, that's the province's problem. Um, that's not good enough. I think they should use bilateral agreements because this takes the fire out of the politics of healthcare and um, transfer authority to agree Manitoba, Ontario, Saskatchewan, we'll put in the money for your peeps for dental coverage. Um, if can you if you transfer the authority to this Canadian Dental Agency, and the Canadian Dental Agency will run the plan. I like this idea. I think it, then you have accountability. Uh, you have one place to decide the formulary, so um, and one place to develop performance metrics and so on. I know it's a bit of a uh, kumbaya moment but I mm -hmm. think this would be a really fantastic thing and if this could work then perhaps it might encourage us to do this for other parts of Medicare as well so it would be a good trial run on something perhaps not as you know um, politically loaded as physician services but uh, we could start with that and but another important part of this is that you know all of this stuff would take two, three, four, five years to to actually uh, negotiate, put in place. It takes a long time, uh, and to make sure that you get it right. And I think starting now, the federal government should be uh, giving grants, which they're entitled to do, um, to uh, innovative uh, folks in the community, dental dental groups, um, dental hygienists schools uh, and so on to develop programs within schools and within community settings right mm -hmm. so there needs to be some meat on the access part 
how do you do that, right? Because people aren't all going to go to those white, shiny clinics. Uh, the way you do that is you get care old school, right, in the schools, in the community, uh, you know, with the, with the dental bus and uh, these kinds of things, the dental nurse. Uh, and I think that that would be terrific. And so the feds could do that right now. And I think it's a damn shame they didn't do that right now uh, as part of the rollout of this plan for the next two years because they could have. Um, and I suspect maybe there was some uh, stakeholder opposition to something along those lines. But um, that's the kind of thing we need to do. So thanks for your time. Really fun to talk to you about this. And I look forward to hearing what Razor has to say and your, your comments uh, as well. I'd love to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. Okay, so I'm up here. Or microphone here? Or? No. Oh, okay. But uh, I mean, this is recorded yeah, okay. here, so you can speak. You can actually sit there. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from Pauline, and given how strong her team is, this is more a caution that these are some things that aren't as clear as they could be. Although there's one or two things I don't quite agree with, but I think it, it's a neat piece of work. One of the things is I think the analysis blurred a number of different policy issues that may have somewhat different ways of dealing with them. One is the financing, which is who's going to pay for what, how are they going to pay it, and how much are they going to pay. Then there's the delivery issue, which is who's going to be delivering that care, uh, where, to whom, and there's a bit about it, you know, in terms of the role of charities. I also didn't see anything on dental schools. And there's, there's quite a bit of dental schools offering uh, care, either free or cheaper, in order to help train the students. So if you don't mind the, uh, having your stuff done by a student, uh, you can get uh, cheaper care that way. Then the whole slew of private providers. Then there's the question of coverage, which you were talking about, which is way Who's going to get covered? How, is it based on age? Is it based on income? Is it based on needs? For what are they going to be covered? Which is your thing of trying to decide what the portfolio and then what the rules are. Are you going to set what the fees could be? Are you going to set what the co pays could be? Um, I also didn't notice any mention of prevention, things like uh, fluoridation and healthy eating and other things like that, which can be very key for them. You know. But an, another small point, and this is just a uh, the, the history part is a little bit misleading because we never required payment for anything other than care in hospitals or by physicians. So that's the big problem. Eye care doesn't get covered, uh, dental care, pharma care, anything. And it's one of the reasons you have this whole issue with ALC patients, because the minute you leave the hospital, all kinds of things that will be paid for in the hospital do not have to be paid for the minute you leave the hospital. So this is an ongoing thing right across the system, is that we set up a system which only requires coverage for medically necessary care by doctors who are in hospitals. You can go beyond it, but you don't have to. And all the Canada Health Act does is provide some rules. It doesn't do the spending. So this whole thing about this 50-50, no, <laughs> the rule, the question about what the current federal share is, is misleading beyond Earth, because if you want to play games, take a look at how people work out what the federal share is. They play games with the numerator, they play games with the denominator, because 50-50 was only for hospital care and doctor care. <clears throat> and one of the reasons they changed that is there was a, I don't know if you know, there was a, a randomized trial of nurse practitioners in Burlington, and they found they worked great, but it failed because if the patient was seen by the nurse practitioner, the province got zero dollars from the feds, whereas if they were seen by a doctor, they'd get 50 cents on the dollar. So they changed the rules to say, no, no, there's a federal share and this is a minimum, but you can go beyond it. So, uh, and then they also changed how they handled it into uh, tax points and transfers and things. So a lot of the federal money goes into a number of things, not just hospitals. And there's also the feds reduce their share of taxes to allow the provinces to increase theirs. So if you want to start playing with, oh, you're not giving this enough money, they take all health spending, not just the doctors and hospitals, and they don't look at the, uh, the tax points. So don't fall into the 
the game of the 50-50 have it gone down because that is a game. But anyway, um, and you, you're also totally right about the U.S., but you also didn't mention how many people are uninsured. There's more people uninsured than the whole population of Canada. Anyway, uh, going to the policy options, um, the Canada Health Act does not have to have all provinces on board. It's rules for funding because every one of the things that came in was on a province by province basis. I mean, HIVS, medical care, art, all of those were negotiated between the feds and the individual provinces. And the fact that they all decided to come on board. So your model about why don't we do it um, by basically bilateral, it's the same unless you're gonna allow different provinces to strike different deals. And that is going to be so fraught with problems about, okay, how come you gave Newfoundland a better deal than you gave us? Mm -hmm. that I'm not sure that's a particularly viable way to go at. Mm -hmm. So your Canada Health Act model and your bilateral agreements are basically the same model, which is you, you basically see if the provinces are going to come on board, and then you go at it. Um, the direct payment, I also was a little confused. Uh, not only is it constitutional, but would you have to pay 100 cents on the dollar as opposed to 50 cents on the dollar, or more or less, because if you want the the other models, the provinces pay some of it, the, and the feds pay some of it, as opposed to the feds paying all of it. So, you know, it's just, again, a, a clarification. And I liked your point about the community-based dental clinics, but that might fit in because we could say, okay, look, what we're going to do is subsidize the charitable models, which is the way a lot of the, the original hospital stuff came in. And so we're going to be doing that. And so for things like Moses, those sorts of coverages, we would find charities that would be able to help. Um, the intergovernmental arm's length agency, I didn't find particularly convincing. Uh, you also didn't mention the role of provincial regulatory bo uh, bodies, but it's sort of almost like you're going to throw in an NHS sort of model, which is the state's going to run this type of care, as opposed to the state's going to come in and subsidize the costs of some of the care, but not all, because there's all kinds of dental things that you may or may not need. And how do we make sure that we have the baselines that we need? So um, I think there's some extremely neat stuff there. I'm not entirely convinced that the suggestion you made is going to be the best one, as opposed to a combination of funding some of the charitable things and trying to get the provinces to set up cost chair agreements to be covering particular things. But I'm really delighted to see that people are actually working on the area. So that's oh, thank you. Yeah. Hey, comment or we go for the questions first. Sure, you got any questions then no, I can come back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I have selected some questions. Now there are some students who um you may have sent me questions who couldn't be here. So um, I will um, name some students. If you feel that your question was already addressed in the presentation, uh, you can uh, you can say so. I, I go to the next person. Okay. So I'll start with uh, Emily. Emily Grove. Yeah, my question was addressed about the integration. I guess yeah, okay. I would say that the integration of 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 and then the federal plan mentioned the paper has a similar flavor as a care of last resort, creating this two tier system where you have kind of a mix of public payers and also private insurers. So obviously, this raises a lot of logistical questions, like is it eligibility of you know, each potential candidate? So, I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit about how a Canadian dental agency would be able to best place to answer those questions while. Know the spirit of accountability, but also staking or respecting the division of powers. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not saying that they would set the rules of the game, right? So this would be something that the federal government would determine. I would say. So is are they going to go for universal coverage uh, for everybody, or are they going to go for coverage for the under ninety thousand as they're planning? Whichever way they go on that, that would be obviously the the uh, requirement or the you know the guidepost for the uh, for the for the agency to work with, and then that agency would receive funding primarily from the federal government um, because 
you know, the provinces don't spend much on dental care now, but if they are willing to upload their funding, that also could be administered by that dental agency. So the advantage of the dental agency is not that it sets, you know, normatively what um, the criteria should be around who's covered and who's not, but that they would do the hard work of sort of formulary. So what is what is actually included and on what kind of conditions, right? So in what circumstances would you uh, be able to have orthodontic, for example? Because that's probably a really big one. Um, have so, it or have it publicly paid for. Have it publicly paid for, right? So that's the whole point of this thing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and what circumstances would it be publicly paid for? Right. So those are difficult, you know, questions. Um, and then uh, potentially then it could also be administering the funding to the dentist. Uh, and then over time, uh, if, uh, my suggestion around the funding by the federal government via grants to community, you know, to community groups, uh, that could also be devolved to this agency as well. So in terms of the society conditions, how we will be monitoring this kind of divided and separate funding and resources to each Canadian, for example, but it's not that, you know, Canadian blood service equivalent of the other spaces doing that, that falls within each province. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by that? Monitoring what? So, I mean, in, in terms of potentially splintered healthcare system. So yeah. for each, for me, for example, I'm partially covered by you know, private insurance, but then also partially covered publicly. Yeah. So I'm wondering who is then best suited to kind of look at those on a case-by-case basis and decide who gets what. Right. So, so currently what they're saying is that they will be doing this payment payer of last resort. I don't think it's a good way to go myself, but you know, if that carries through to the uh, requirements, that would be part of your eligibility, right? So you won't get funding from the Canadian Digital Agency until you've you know, shown that you've exhausted your private private pay, right? So your employer plan of those So but the dynamics of that is something that you know we're going to have to understand, right? Um, it would seem to me that as uh, uh, you know, if I uh, as an employer, if I could get my employees into the public plan, that would save a, a big cost on the, on the, on what I have to pay for employee benefits. But you could still, of course, cover all the hairdresser stuff. So the stuff above the public plan, just you know, as we uh, potentially do for other. Is that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated question. So. No, no, um, but it's it's true. You know, we will be whenever you have more um, uh, public and private insurers. If you're trying to you're trying to um, look at the questions of what uh, of the movements, for example, of dentists between public and private and that upselling and these kinds of things. It is true that the Canadian Digital Agency may, you know, depending on what powers it is given, but if a province can delegate its power to to the agency to, a, you know, monitor report at least and perhaps even do more on those things. So that's, I think, is the central takeaway from this, which is, I think, interesting, right? Just as we have administrative agencies that um, the federal government appoints, for example, to determine immigration and refugee <coughs> matters, right? It's not the government itself, it's this agency that is arm's length that does this. So too could they for dentistry. I think we just got kind of, you know, got so caught up in the Fed prof that it's Fed, so they can't do it. And like, no, it's just an agency that would be funded by the federal government, so it gets support by the federal government. Provinces agree to do that. There's actually no um, problem with that. So they don't need to leave that regulatory power back in the provinces they don't want to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK. So I'll take um, uh, Mina and maybe uh, two questions. You know, Mina and uh, Avita, because the questions are somewhat related. You know, Mina? Sure. Um, so my question kind of has two parts. Um, the first is like what the current sentiment um, among the dental profession looks like regarding 
regarding the expansion. Um, and I know that the paper noted that you know, it should be welcomed by dentistry experts because that was like cited to the dental public health program. Um, so I'm kind of wondering if general members, members of the profession that just don't have the same focus on public health are actually receptive um, to this. And then the yeah. reason why I ask is kind of the second part of the question. I'm um, just wondering how the support of the dental profession might actually affect how effective the policy proposals are. So, for example, like the grant system. Yeah. Um, if the dental profession is able to like take up the offer of the federal government to have grants and have community clinics, um, does that mean there's going to be access on paper but not in practice? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, so, uh, 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 Fita, would you say it's more more or less related as well to? Yeah, I was. My question was very, very similar. I just think, you know, and more broadly, when we're discussing health policy, they seem like such a big stake in this discussion. I mean, it is so privatized. They have regulatory bodies in provinces. And my question, maybe just to expand on it a little bit, is I think it's kind of the vet system in Alberta, and I think it's developed in Ontario. I couldn't say either regulation, but when I go to the vet, they say it's going to be $200 for this, $100 for this, $60 for this. Before those services are provided, and like, is there an aspect that you could or you consider of going to those regulatory bodies and maybe a little bit more boots on the ground regulation approach to not solve the entire issue? I appreciate the system is still needed, but perhaps to create or address one aspect of the accessibility in the larger scope of change. Right. So, your point is uh, let's have more price competition by being more transparent about the prices. So the province would have to regulate that. The federal government could not do that and it still wouldn't help Moses. So, you know, people have very high needs. Uh, and, you know, this, even with the problem, even with dental insurance coverage for some groups, they're still not getting access. So this is a real problem. Uh, and, you know, my point is that, um, we sort of, uh, if, we, if we don't think this is a problem, we're missing the boat. <laughs> like there's a, a lot of people are really suffering because they don't have access to, to dental coverage um, and they can't pay out of pocket for it. Um, so why we would leave them um, you know, out on the limb, I'm not really sure. The dental profession, much like the medical profession, at the advent of Medicare, um, are generally, I understand, not enthusiastic. Um, you know, they want to keep it as it is, or at most, just as with the physicians that they've been Medicare, just cover the poor um, and leave the private charge on top. Um, and, you know, they basically proffer really no reason why that should be. Um, it would cause an economic disturbance or something like this that mm -hmm. contain. But this is very similar to what we dealt with at the advent of Medicare. So in doubt, they will not be um, all through, but there will be some uh, who have more of a social justice mindset um, who will want to create these kinds of community-based clinics. They sort of already do. Um, and they are prepared to work with the public pay patients now. Uh, and so there is an opportunity there. I think the really important thing is to liberalize more um, other kinds of healthcare, uh, dental healthcare providers, like dental nurses and dental therapists. So for years here, the dentists, um, every year, the um, dental hygienists were going to the legislature here in Ontario to ask for an amendment so that they could practice on their own steam. Um, and every year they were thwarted by the dental profession in opposition to them, uh, which when you think about it, you know, if they were able to just set up shop all over the place and just provide that kind of basic kind of cleaning would be huge. And I think it's only the last year or so, relatively recently that, uh, actually I'm not even sure they have, got out of the, under the bum of that. So the only way they could practice was inside a dentist's office, right, as opposed to out and about. So I think the, the idea of the federal government, and I should probably illuminate this more on the paper, um, putting money into the community on that, that there would be perhaps, I hope, opportunity for, you know, 
more of these alternative kinds of providers to come to provide the access that people people need. And not to say again, there are some really great dentists out there who want to do this too. And I think you know, if it became more of a uh, once once the benefits uh, become more broad, right? It's not just for the incredibly poor. Uh, it's more you know more normal for normal normal people to have public coverage. Um, hopefully, as well, it will become um, more you know okay for the for the dentists. They will see the benefit of it. And I think for the physicians, you know, over time they found out that actually it's pretty nice to have. Um, public Medicare because you just send your bill to one place and you don't have to deal with all the insurers and all the co-pays and all that kind of thing. So there, you know, there's some advantages to public payment. Um, you don't have to deal with stacks of paper all the time. Uh, so there, so that's really helpful. But thank you for the question. Is your question related, more or less related to the other? Well, yeah, I, I, I've got lots of patients uh, the observation was the day before the announcement, I call them to get up in advance to get picked up all my dental charts from CCHS and send them to it right away. That was the day before the announcement, so I sort of felt, 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 felt a minor involvement in it right from day one. Uh -huh. And Al and, and Allison is, is the idiot of the social policy. Always, when she, when we shop, she always talked about this issue of how. Uh, of how uh, services can be delivered out of the federal pocket. And it seemed like the last key, these people talk about what do you mean that the services we are going to put out as an economist? I think that's totally fabulous, okay? But, but she always seems to think that they're, you know, I, I can't speak for her, but the observations I hear seem to suggest to me that she's always concerned about being pushed back from the provinces because they don't get the political, they don't get the political brownie points. If, it, if it's got the Fed name really out there, okay, that's and that's the question. How can you how can be your last thing and keep that process happy, but in fact deliver? Because I think if I think if that if France could have seen it, they probably done it. I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know that that last point is true. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, what I see of policy folks, you know. Is swimming around the sea of misinformation, disinformation, uh, lack of clarity around division of powers. What are they actually able to do? Political convenience, because today it's good to say, you know, healthcare is a matter of provincial jurisdiction until they want it back again, um, you know, and so forth and so on. So I don't know that, you know, the, the fact that it's, um, the art of the possible was always there. I hadn't realized some of this stuff until I, until I had these long, deep conversations with Peter Oliver about spending power. So, uh, and I've been looking at this for quite some time. So I don't think so. I think that actually, um, that's why I was saying, you know, like, let's, let's really flush it out. Let's kick out like our old thinking, really flush out sort of what, what uh, and not, you know, they say kick out our old thinking privatize that's obviously not where I am <laughs> but I'm um, like kick out our old thinking and let's get creative about the powers that the federal government has what can it really do to improve healthcare um, and you know perhaps this isn't you know the path forward isn't an arm's length agency but I look at the Canadian blood services I think it's a high performing organization and it's done stuff uh, for Canada uh, you know, it's improved our, uh, you know, how the quality and safety of the blood supply. I think it's done a pretty good job. Um, so, you know, if, if there's, yeah, if there, if that is something that we can imagine working for other parts of dental care. And I think the status quo, like you hear that a lot now, the status quo is not acceptable. We need to, the status quo is not acceptable. We need to improve the public health care system. And that's what we need to think about. When we're designing dental care, let's not make the mistakes again that were made with Medicare, which was, you know, it's all just, um, it's just so obvious when you think about it, that if you don't enforce accessibility, that we won't have accessibility. If you don't measure it, if you don't care about it, um, and then you just say, well, the provinces have accountability for it, but they don't because their accountability is, every three or four years at the you know, election polls, but you vote on all sorts of things uh, there. 
I think most of us, when you're really sick, you know, kind of, you just want to get over it, you come back out of that, you never want to think about it again. So it's hard to, um, you know, think that all the people are, are voting about the healthcare system. Can I say one of the I've done a bunch of work on and the production characteristics vary enormously depending on what sort of things you're talking about. So one of the problems is the measurability for a lot of things in healthcare is not very high. Um, it, you know, it's quite different for things like pharmaceuticals. That yes, the lab tests you can say, did you do the lab test properly? Or is there a thing in the pharmaceutical product? But to try and get that type of measurability in most clinical services just isn't there. Mm -hmm. So that's tricky. And if you're talking to me, but well, you can have accountability for some very yeah. kind of clear, kind of almost consumer metrics, right? You Which can, is what in the number of days, you sort of have to look at the professional bodies because there's enough homogeneity, a heterogeneity in the patients that you could get real differences in what the outcomes are, which is not a function necessarily of the services. I mean, well, yeah, yeah, but I think, you know, like when you go to buy an insurance policy, it lays out what the stuff is you're going to get. Yes, exactly. And, and then and if you're in Planet Canada and hurricane strikes, nothing is covered. Okay. But the uh, one of the other things is with the Canadian blood service, what they're doing is just they're mainly trying to get to patients. Uh, drug and people donating organs. But then the service delivery is not by them at all. They give it to the provinces and it goes out. So as a model for care delivery by individual providers, I'm not sure Canadian blood services is the best model for it. I think um, it was assuming that I'm talking about a NHS model and I'm not Razor. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the power and the funding and the performance measures and all that sort of stuff would be there. But of course, Dentists would still be in, you know, their dental offices okay, yeah. and billing rates right, through to this to this uh, to this agency if they want to. Yeah. So I think a lot of work on what makes sense and what sorts of services need to be delivered where and how and some sort of sense about what the, the payment yeah. level should be and working with uh, how do you put people in touch with, with uh, guys who give them the care that they need. There's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of cases there. But I'm just not sure that the constant analogies to the blood service agency can work for the sorts of services you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so let me, uh, maybe because this is related to one of the questions, uh, no, no, dear, uh, the question by J Jasmine. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> Jasmine said, sorry. damn, I was. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah so it was given to me that what uh, constitutes this essential oral health care is not a straightforward question, and I agree that. And uh, while there may be patients with straightforward answers of coverage or not lack thereof, there will inevitably be patients in the gray area. Um, and that will lead to issues that arise in patients who might believe that a particular issue should be covered, and a dentist or their office may need to make immediate or like snap decisions on whether or not that is something. The question is, how will this problem of initial and like long-term subjective decision making of dentists and of their respective, like an often understaffed offices be addressed? And what avenues will people be able to take to resolve the issues that arise? Mm -hmm. And how can they make that accessible to folks who may not understand what happens? Well, we have, we have a lot of experience with uh, creating these kinds of formularies. So we do this for pharmaceuticals. So we have a you know formulary to decide what is covered and what isn't. So we have a federal one called CADF in Quebec, it's called NS. Uh, we have some provincial ones and they do this analysis of pharmaceuticals and they give advice to the government or the payer about how to cover it and when to cover it. So we have a lot of experience with that. And what's really important is that there is um, generally an opportunity for people who are particularly affected. So perhaps there is some, I, mean, I don't know if this is so, but some kind of dental service that really only works for a very particular group and you're thinking, you know, thinking you're not going to cover it. That that group has some opportunity to make their views heard. Right, so uh, this idea is uh, it's really from the Ministry of Law, like procedural fairness, but in ethics, it's uh, Norman Daniels' accountability for reasonableness. 
they're basically you're transparent, you're open, you account for yourself, you show the evidence, like we listen to all these people. We heard what you said about the need to have coverage for orthodontic treatment because it's so critical for job success, but we're still only going to make it available in these particular criteria, right? So even then, if you don't like the outcome, then you at least generally, you know, the viewers, you've had a chance, you've had some opportunity, so you may not like the decision, but you feel you've had some of it. It's just, right? So often decisions made, we don't like them, but at least we've had some chance to participate. So there's may so that should really clear up. Um, you know, it, either, it will either be covered or not covered. Um, there may be some clinical discretion where the, someone meets the clinical parameters for for coverage, but I don't think you're going to have sort of standoffs in the in the dental waiting room. You know, yelling at people or that sort of stuff. I think that would probably be fine. But that's where the formulary part is really important whether it's provincial or federal or you know my agency idea that's really really important and that has to evolve over time so you know one of the things you know we find with uh, hospital and physician services physician services are basically what's funded is what they negotiate um, insurance for uh, so you know they come up with a big list and there's not not really any real um evidence uh, much kind of considered about what should be funded in long term. So so there again there's a bit of better chance to do this for dental care, I think. Yeah. But yeah, the formula thing is, yeah, is, is a good thing. Okay, yeah. Um Preeti. Hi. Um so basically I was wondering what you thought of the strict ninety thousand eligibility for household income and whether you thought that, that Well, as you can tell from my comments, I think it, it should just be covered for everyone. Um, I just think it's, it's, you know, we're paying a lot of money. I know my healthcare provider is paying, my employment plan is paying a ton of money for not very much. So I would prefer to have that money in my salary, you know. So, uh, so it would make sense to me that we would have one plan, but I am, you know, pretty keen on public plans. So um, in the absence of that, uh, you know, yes, I think it should be a higher level, but, you know, how to figure that out would require um, some better and more calculations than I can do on the fly for you right here. So you need to figure that out. But I agree with you. If you've got more kids, uh, you know, obviously life is a bit tougher, but other people have, you know, there's all sorts of issues that people face. Children are a burden and a joy, but so there are other, uh, you know, costs and stuff here folks uh, have to encounter in their lives. I mean, the real thing is, so I always give this example for pharmacare, but the same is like the truth for dental care. So I have allergies and um, I get this uh, medicine called satirism. And um, and I like it, it seems to work for me quite well. When I went to Ottawa, I couldn't believe it. Like I just was like a mess. And it turns out Ottawa was a big valley here. Like, you know, the pollen, it's right at the bottom. Uh, so I rock in one day to the, uh, to the pharmacist to pick up my prescription. And today, because the insurance has run out on the prescription, I, it was $92 or $87, actually, $87. I'm like, holy crap, how much is this thing? And, um, and my husband is a pharmacologist. So I go home to him and say, darling, why is this like some like breakthrough drug or something? Why is it so expensive? He's like, no, it's a generic. Hmm. I'm like, wow, how come it's $97, $87? And he's like, well, you know, it's just what they can get away with. And he looked it up in New Zealand where they have a public plan. This very same drug is $4. That's what you pay, $4. So my employer or me, sucker, is paying, you know, normally I have it insured. So we're paying, you know, $83 more than everybody in New Zealand is paying for this generic drug. Right? That means it's the same chemicals crunched up and stuck in a pill. 
is what the breakthrough claims. So like, well, if it's, you know, brand name, I mean, maybe that justifies, but no, it's not. <coughs> because there's nobody pushing back on the price. Right? I'm just a patsy, I pay it my, because my private insurer pays it. So this is the trouble with private insurance, right? It sounds like a great deal, but it's not real. And particularly once you start realizing all the co-pays that are paying at a point of service, you add them all up. They're actually what most normal people would pay in public plans, um, you know, for, for their insurance. So, sorry to wait on and to move into other fields. Uh, Lauren? Lauren George? Okay, okay, that's what I told us here. Uh, is there anybody else who had a particular question? I mean, there are a couple of further questions. Yes, for yeah, sure. I, I can't talk to you about the other way. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, in terms of you mentioned under the provincial things like um, people who uh, qualify for ODS who might have some dental coverage, and um, in my opinion, in my personal experience, it's like certainly not enough. Um, but I was wondering how you think uh, uh, Canada's dental care plan would interact with those sorts of programs and whether it would put more moments on individuals. Who would yeah, well, uh, that's a really great question as well. So I think basically you would, everyone would have insurance through this one plan. Uh, and, you know, if the, if the folks um, running the disability plan wanted to provide more, than the formulary, then you still may have to fill out some forms over here. But at least you would have kind of you know universal coverage for kind of a core of, of dental services. And you wouldn't have to do anything except go to the dentist, right? just as you go to the doctor. And then they would bill the Canadian dental services plan. And it would be the same whether you're know, someone living with a disability or you're someone who isn't. You're someone with four kids, you're someone with 10 kids, you're someone with no kids, universal. So, so in your plan, it would like, oh, they already qualified for some ODS people so we're going to take that off. Well, no, I don't think so, but this is what they're proposing, yeah. right? which I think is daft. Like, it makes it difficult. And, you know, the, one of the wins, it's a really good point, actually, you should mention this, is, you know, one of the wins for the dentist, but they wouldn't have to deal with all that mm -hmm. as well, right? They just have one stop shopping. And, you know, that is a major advantage. The money just winds up in the bank account and you don't have to do a whole lot. Yeah. What would happen if you integrated with the OBIT, particularly with all the Ontario health teams, which is supposed to be going across multiple uh, health providers anyway? Rather than having to set up a federal model, if there was federal funding for OBIT just to add the formulary of dental services to, to the OBIT team? Well, that's a really good uh, idea. I don't know that they're doing that though. Are they including dentists in there? Well, no, but I'm just saying if you wanted to be doing it. Yes. Certainly, for a lot of the practice, right. Well, then, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I don't don't see why that would affect this, except to the extent that they're getting paid some sort of capitated amount. Well, the other sorts of models, so mm -hmm. it just seems that it might be possible to instead mm -hmm. of setting up a separate agency for it to have the agency decide on the formula. Well, uh, but who would be? Uh, you know, so the funding would go then to uh, Health Ontario to go to yeah. the, yeah. So again, you'd have to do all the Canada Health Act kind of agreement mm -hmm. though. Well, it's not yeah. Canada Health Act agreement. They're, 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 uh, the funding model is separate from Canada Health Act, and as you know. So the funding models are things like the transfer, the health and social services transfers. So what you do is you have a transfer, which would cover some of those costs. And then you would have it incorporated in because it would seem there'd be way less uh, bureaucracy and way less forms. So I don't really understand it, Grace. So I'll have to ask you more about later what I okay. mean by that because uh, I can't imagine you just hand over money to the provinces. What we've seen is that it never gets spent on anything yeah. new. Well, no, mm -hmm. you have some criteria about no. what the money has to pay for. Once you do that, you're starting to sound like you're regulating. No, you're saying Maybe. if you want the money, just in terms of vision. Money. You don't want the money. You don't can I ask a yeah. Can yeah. I ask a last question? And it's more, uh, it's probably quite open ended. But um, would you say so? In in uh, on a 
on a model that we have in Medicare and in dental care as well, where you pay per service, we always have overuse. There always has to be control on uh, on uh, unnecessary services and referrals. And you gave the example of, uh, uh, you know, orthodontic services that are often simply kind of uh, more for um, uh, similar to plastic surgery. So would you say that in dental care, we, have, we will have more problems of trying to control uh, unnecessary services that are basically more aesthetic and is, um, is, is well, there... you know, I, I think Razor's actually spoken on this in the past very eloquently. You know, most of us don't really want to sign up for a hip operation. I don't know. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we're not running in to like say, give me surgery, you know, yeah. or I really want my teeth cleaned today. Like I'm desperate. Please look at my filling. That's really what I want to do with my life this afternoon. Yeah. Like no one does that. No, but so, the, but the, the also part of this, um, this will come down to the formula, yeah. right? And I think this is the tricky part because there are some uh, orthodontic treatments that are really, uh, you know, that are in space. And then there are some people that have such appalling teeth, even though it's not a health thing. Mm-hmm. You know, they're really their future life chances are. It's a quality uh, of life. A sure. picture of some guy, who, and I can't really remember the degenerative thing that leads to this, where. You essentially lose all your teeth in the front and you've kind of just yeah. got like little Dracula fangs here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, exactly. So you laugh at this poor guy and uh, and everybody else does. So when they, he got his teeth fixed, then he you know, finally got employed and he couldn't get any kind of job looking like this. And so, yeah, no, you know, sure. so there might be some at the margins who are saying like some of this purely cosmetic is actually, you know, just as yeah. we do sort of um, breast reconstruction well, after cancer and, yeah, and yeah. these kinds of things. I mean, you know, that's cosmetic, but uh, you don't need them, yeah. um, mm-hmm. but uh, you want them. So, you know, we have to have those kinds of conversations as part of the formula. But your point is a really important one, which is about the upselling, right? So when you have, you know, we're coming from a very private place and a lot of us you know we go and we have all these extra things done whitening and this kind of stuff and that's what the dentists are used to doing um and what we're used to getting so um so this is you know it's not going to be easy to to shift the model so that's why i'm saying bring all your guns to the table and uh, and see what we can okay but it's a it's a great question it's a great question Okay, on that note, I think we have to stop because it's exactly two o'clock. So uh, we could continue for quite some time. Please join me in thanking uh, Karina.